All right. So let's bring out the author, the filmmaker, uh, the attorney, Crystal McCrary. This is great. Um, you know, Thanks, things, everybody. Yeah, yeah. So um, you, the interesting thing, uh, just by way of, uh, by, I'm a columnist at the New York Times, and I've been there actually 33 years this month. Um, but the interesting thing, I've covered a lot of stuff at the high end. And the great thing about this film is that um, you, you, you can become so jaded, because by the time a lot of these kids get to the professional level, and even the col at the high college level, They've just become so, you forget what innocence means. Uh, and the great thing about this is it reminds me of the real joy and the, the, the innocence of uh, professional sports uh, or sport, what sports is. Did that, as you were shooting this, did that sort of remind you um, of sort of the, you know, the, the innocence of this? Absolutely, Bill. Um, one of the... Um things about little ballers and what's unique about the boys in this film or really any kid 10, 11 years old in sports is this is the last age of innocence. And I thought that that was particularly um, inspiring because all these kids in this film, I mean, they think they're going to walk on the moon. They think they're going to play in the NBA. Um, there's nothing that they don't think that they can accomplish. And that was something that um, inspired me to actually put the camera on them. I mean, my son's one of the boys in the film, which is actually how I started with the camera. Uh, I was just a sports mom um, with the camera. I mean, I've produced and made other films, but never one that profiled my own child. And so it started there. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I knew that I wanted to, um, really from a very independent filmmaker's perspective, just put a camera on them, guerrilla style filmmaking. I know there are a lot of filmmakers in the audience, and that's what you do. You just start with the camera. You start with the content, the raw content. And what drove that? was the innocence, and also this quote by Magic Johnson that I start the film with that I think is in the trailer, which is, all kids need is a little help, a little hope, and someone who believes in them. And that was what resonated with me throughout the process. I'm just curious, in the audience, how many of you um, have children or grandchildren that are involved in any type of youth sports? Yes. Okay, so uh, I really hope you see the whole thing because it, it really becomes very uh, rele relevant. I'm just curious, I never asked you this in previous screen, how did this change your relationship with Cole? Um, you know, it's one thing just to kind of do it for fun, but as you had the bigger vision, and maybe you could also tell us about how you went from this camera, I mean, you know, just the mom with the camera, to saying, wow, this could be product. How did that change your relationship with your, with your child? Well... Um, when you all hopefully see the entire film, I mean, Cole is an incredibly passionate kid. Um, I'd like to think that he's just this naturally athletic, aggressive kid with lots of um, emotions that come out through the game. And so I had to wear two distinct caps in uh, making this film. I had on my mom's cap, where I'm in the stand screaming like all the other moms, and then I had on the filmmaker's cap. And so the things that were important to me in profiling all of these um, individuals, kids, parents, families, because really it was the families that let me come into their, their lives and their kids' lives. And I, one, wanted to be um, truthful. I wanted to be authentic. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that they all had their integrity in the telling of the story. Um, a lot of people who follow sports, who follow you know, AAU basketball, have heard so much about the underbelly of this world. And in fact, after I had completed the film and was shopping it around, there were a number of places that made offers or that were interested in the film, uh, but they're like, well, why don't you show you know, this negative side, or, or why don't you show the, the mothers acting crazy and getting into fights? <laughs> or, you know, why don't you show this, this really, you know, negative side of the world? And I wasn't trying to be untruthful or paint um, an unrealistic world, but I wanted to be honest 
and yet at the same time allow them to have their truth be shown in a dignified manner. And so I say that long answer to tell you how the relationship with my son changed. I asked him every step of the way. Um, are you okay with this? How do you feel about this? And as you will see, hopefully, when you see the film, this gave him an opportunity to work through various emotions and really kind of figure out how to channel um, his anger and aggression in the right way on the court, not take it out on the refs, and put it into his game rather than to put it into screaming at the refs, which is never a good thing. <laughs> and, yeah, you know, that, yeah, you got to see the film because there are a lot of, a lot of things that she's referencing uh, even with her own son, you know, bless bless his heart, just very emotional, got suspended, and just the whole the An whole eleven thing. year old, eleven year old going on twenty five. But you know, a couple of things you'll see. You, you've noticed for a lot of these kids, eleven, who are just fantasizing about, or ten, who are fantasizing about going to the NBA and that kind. Of, the business side, they they have no clue really of just the harsh business side of this stuff. And they you, shouldn't yeah. at 11 years old. Right. But did you find, though, that even in AAU, and you didn't really show a lot of it here, that even with AAU, there is a business side to this, just in terms of everybody doesn't get to make the team, everybody doesn't get to play, because uh, we're trying to win a championship now. And that means that your role may be a role of a cheerleader. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? But not necessarily. Well, it's, you know, they're... they're one of the there are nine over 900 registered AAU teams in the tri-state area. So there's a wide array of complexities and layers of how teams are made up, which I will not bore you with in this discussion. But is there a business side to the AAU circuit this young? Absolutely. I mean, maybe 11, not quite so much, except to the extent that many of these AAU teams are sponsored by. Um, you know, Nike or Under Armour or Adidas, and it may not be the little kids that are the showcase players, but these various AAU organizations can be from, you know, second grade up through high school, and then sort of there's a trickle-down effect with the um, younger kids that get these this gear. Yeah. And so the business part of it, when you look at the marketing and you look at the sneaker companies, it's the 10, 11, 12-year-old kids that are, you know, shoe crazy. And so that's what sort of drive. if they're wearing them, if LeBron's wearing them, or Kevin Durant's wearing them, that's what the kids want to wear. Yeah. Or Skylar Diggins. I got to get the women in as well. That's right. It's coming. You know, they haven't quite ascended to the corruption of the, but this is a, this is a good evening. You We're always want to take it to the dark side. No, though. no. Well, no. But, but that, and actually, that's what was refreshing about this is that, you know, this, these are nice kids. In fact, we should show a clip, one of the first clips, sure. because... Again, at the core of this is a group of young people having fun, being with each other, uh, traveling kids. with each other, being young people. Being As Carmelo kids. says, Carmelo, right. one of Carmelo Anthony's fun quotes, he's like, never forget that you're kids. You know, he was like, if I could do it all over again, I would play with the same AAU organization, the same kids. They are my brothers. They are my family. Yeah. yeah. So maybe we could show uh, uh, one of the first clips here and you could tell us what we've sure. seen. Tell them. Okay, so right. Crystal, what do you do? Now that's Crystal's son. <laughs> He's yelling at. So when you see that over and over again, I mean, I know you become sort of anesthetized to it now. <laughs> but but what what did, what did you think when you first saw that? Did you see? And I, clearly, you saw that live, right? When it happened. Oh, that was slight work. Him yelling there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to see the no. rest of the film. This is easy. No, here. no. Um, in all seriousness, I mean, I'm not a bad mom. That I, I don't want that to come across. That I let the. the coach to scream my children. Um, you know, it's interesting because several of the NBA players that are in the film um, who saw that in like agents or just AAU players that contributed, um, I was questioning at first. I said, well, what do you think about this with Coach Billy and where he's screaming? And pretty much across the board, every player, every coach are like, oh, my coach was much worse than that. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that the main point about that is the kids know, and you'll see when you see the film, that Coach Billy is coming from a place of love. 
um, you don't see how much of a, in that scene, if we're consolidating it to that, you don't see how much he is a mentor to the kids, how much he's the first one there trying to help them do their homework or get a tutor, um, taking them to museums, you know, extracurricular activities, you know, just a, a, another father figure to them. And I think one of the themes we discuss as well with coaches, if you have a good coach, um, that coach becomes like a second parent. Um, and another way to offer a second family, to offer structure. There are a number of boys in the film, a number of boys across the country in, in urban communities and suburban communities where um, they just don't have um, father figures around and the coaches truly can offer that. The teams can offer that family structure. I mean, one of the great... Um, quotes that Joachim Noah from the Chicago Bulls was in the film. He does a lot of work with gangs in Chicago, and the point, the very simple point, he says, anything that keeps kids off the streets right. is a good thing. And um, I would have to say that the the yelling from Coach Billy or even other coaches as well, because I always knew that my son was ultimately safe and the other kids were safe, um, and that it was truly coming from a place of I'm trying to help you. Um, become a better person, to become a young man, that that was the spirit and the energy from which it was um, spoken. Yeah, and that, that, I mean, it's very interesting. I'm sure it, in some of the questions of those of you who, who remember this or you do have children involved in youth sports, I'd be curious to hear what you have to say about that because there's such a thin line between discipline. And anybody who's played sports has kind of gone through that. Right. Uh, I still hate the coaches who screamed at me. But, you know, well, we're doing this. And it's a stylistic thing as well. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, some are screamers. <laughs> some are screamers. Some are, uh, you know, I guess the more you win, the more you can scream. Like, uh, it, but that, that's another thing for another day. You know, um, but, but one, one last question about the, the process of doing this. What was your process of, of doing this? I mean, once you, from the time you said, you know what, I think we've got something here. What became your, as a filmmaker, your process of sort of bringing this to market and actually telling telling the story. I mean, when, how, how did the story begin to emerge? Sure. Well, um, any of the filmmakers in the audience, I mean, the story oftentimes doesn't truly emerge until you get into the editing room, particularly if you're working on something that's unscripted, like a documentary. But my process, just to give you sort of the independent filmmaker process, I first did just a story on the boys, 18 minutes, and I looked at it as a, hey, we have something here with these boys' stories. And I did it, I, I treated it kind of as a funding trailer. And I sent it out to, you know, several folks trying to bring people on board to help, you know, finish the project. And um, at that point, um, Lupe Fiasco came on board um, as an executive producer. Uh, then Amari Stoudemire came on board. And so with each of them, in the case of Lupe, who, while he's not an athlete, he is a great creative visionary who's deeply connected with his community in Chicago and cares deeply about young urban boys and their well-being. And just as a, you know, helped me tremendously in making sure that I always gave the, the, the boys their integrity in the film. And then Amari came on board and he offered a, a certain type of credibility to the film and bringing other players on board to share their stories. Um, you know, they, all the players are in the film from Russell Westbrook yeah, um, great, to, Ru Russell's great, I mean, by the way, I mean, Russell's quote in the film, um, one of his quotes to me is one of my favorite, particularly for young kids. He says, I was never the best player on my a on any of my AAU teams and look I mean he just won MVP at the All-Star game but then he goes on to say but I always thought that I could be and so for me just that is a testament to work ethic and so many of our kids I think need to hear that you know, the interesting thing you know in fact when you watch this thing with what Russell Westbrook if you see that and you see who he is now it all makes sense because even now he's the, the whole MVP there's no off days for him he went and scored a thousand points because he came into the All Star game saying, "I'm going to be, the, the, I'm going to be the MVP of the All Star game." And, but it comes from if you look at that clip, you realize he's been like this since he was ten, you know, which is interesting. Let's um, see another another uh, another clip. Wow, that was great. That was great. What? It's interesting what the what the last kid said is that basketball really saved his life when his parents 
were going through a divorce. I don't know if everybody heard that, but I mean, that was pretty, that was pretty profound. Yeah, I mean, you hear so many stories like that. I mean, I think that was the young man, Jack, um, who interestingly enough, Coach Billy coached his cousin, who's now at MIT, starting point guard at MIT, brilliant and an athlete, wow. right? Wow. Um, but par stories like that that Jack just shared um, were part of what inspired me to even start filming the boys. I mean, you hear so much just eavesdropping as the carpool mom uh, of, of what these kids would, would, would share about just being able to get away for the weekend, you know, like with, with Tyreek. Um, his mom shares in the film, she, you know, think about this, a mother saying, she said, I'm happy when he's away. I'm, I'm happy when he's not here because I know that he's safe. I know that he's off of these streets. Yeah. And um, Tyreek would express that as well. Um, and I, I felt that I wanted to show their, their innocence, their earnestness, um, and, and, and let people understand how sports is not just about, um, it's not just about what happens on the court. It's not just about winning or losing. And I'm also not one of those people, because I get this question asked a lot, I'm not one of those people that feels that um, sports is the only way out right. for our young men in the neighborhood. Um, there, is, there is something very positive about it. These kids could be playing on a chess club. They could be uh, playing, you know, they could be fencing. They could be doing any number of things. But it just so happens that basketball um, is the vehicle for these boys to expand their lives in so many ways. And as a mother, as a filmmaker, I also wanted to show responsible programming. Yeah. How, how does this differ? Um, I don't know how many of you saw the uh, documentary Hoop Dreams um, a long time ago. How did, which was that was sort of the first classic sort of slice of day in the life of following two kids. Um, how much uh, were you aware of that, and and what was going into this? Was that a model, or or were you, was this going to be the anti hoop dreams? What was sort of your um, no um, uh, hoop dreams? I, I I love that documentary. Steve James, I mean, a very talented documentarian. Um, he also made the great um, film that didn't get as much attention, but uh, the interrupters about interrupting gang violence in, in Chicago. And then he just did the Ebert documentary as well. But uh, the difference between Little Ballers and Hoop Dreams, um, Hoop Dreams focused on the boys when they were in high school. And in high school, there's so much more pressure. Um, it, it really, they're, they're beyond the last stage of innocence. Their families are counting on them in hoop dreams to make sure, you know, th th many of them are first time, you know, college educated kids. This is the way that's going to get them out of their, you know, socioeconomic circumstance. They're going to, you know, which I touch upon a bit in Little Ballers. You see it a little bit with Tyreek because here he is at 11, 12 years old saying he wants to make it to the NBA so he can take care of his mother. So he, you know, he's like the only one who says that. You get like a little taste of it. But in Hoop Dreams, these are boys about to be men. Right. And if they don't get to college um, playing basketball, you get the sense that they're not going to go to college. Um, right. And so we look at education as the, the, the biggest vehicle out. Uh, that is something that um, little ballers we touch upon, but it's not the overall theme of the film. Uh, in that respect, there's a quote there. And, and, and you guys, you really should really see this documentary because there are really some touching moments. Tyreek is, is one, and I, but actually Cole talked a little bit about the NBA, just a little bit, as a fait accompli. But, you know, well, well it, it's, yeah, he speaks of it as a fait accompli, exactly, but he's not speaking about it trying to make money. Right, 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 right. He's right. speaking about it right. just from this deeply passionate place. Which is what, you know, what I find, uh, even from Hoop Dreams to now, what I find interesting is that because the AAU, because there's such a, 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 a roadmap now, you know, even in hope, hoop dreams, there wasn't such a finite. Right now, if if a kid wants to be a professional hockey player, a professional tennis player, a professional, it, it is there is such a a a finite path to take. This school, this program, this club, this thing. It, it's not the wild west anymore. But there's a quote here uh, that I like you to deal with. Uh, 
Travis King, and you'll see it when you guys watch the movie, which you must, by the way. Travis King, who's the vice president of Relativity uh, Sports. Yeah. He said, and they showed a great, there's a great graphic. 10 million kids playing high school ball, 2,000 Division I scholarships, 60 get drafted, and 30 make teams. So you've got this enormous, 10 million kids playing high school ball. Only 2,000 will get Division I scholarships. 60 of them will get drafted. 30 make the team. This is not to say what happened. I mean, those are, those are you can almost be the, become the president of the United States. I mean, it's, the odds are almost, I mean, it's almost in the same ballpark. It's still probably more difficult to become president of the United States, but. <laughs> yeah, and not for the sake of this conversation. That's, <laughs> no, but I mean, but those, those, those odds are tremendous. Oh. Um, um, and, and, you know, one of the things I thought, though, uh, and we're going to go do, jump to another clip. Um, there's a kid named Rod Strickland. I don't know if anybody, any of the old head New Yorkers know about Rod Strickland. So I run a recreation program at my church. And it just so happens that Rod Strickland was 10. That's where he began, at my church. And I used to give this statistic, too. You know, we tell kids, out of 10 million kids, only one of you will. But that's I think. So wait a minute. Somebody's got to be the one. I mean, how come, you know, if somebody told me at 10, well, only one person, who wants to be a journalist? And I'm 10, well, I kind of would. Who would like to work at the New York Times? And I was, oh, are you guys kidding me? On all your South Side Chicago, only one in the 30 million people are going to work at the New York Times. And here I am. So I'm thinking, well, you know, somebody's got to be that person. So why? maybe we should change our approach. Our role as adults is we're going to help you get to be that one in a million. The attorney, the filmmaker, um, you know, so, so maybe that's a, a, another philosophy of how do we make these kids, you know, get to be the one in a million. Right. Well, I think that's the beauty of youth sports and the structure and the construct. It creates an environment of achievement. Right. It creates an environment of discipline that brings families together, that brings communities together around this common goal of winning. Right. And I think within that construct, the kids are surrounded by, um, they're surrounded by the marketing for, for the NBA, for the advertising, for the, for the sneakers, the tournaments that they play in. There are AAU teams now that are sponsored by several NBA and WNBA players. So the entire environment is just supercharge the games of, of AAU teams as young as 12, 13 years old are televised on ESPN now. So there's almost this micro NBA environment that the kids, they can, they can experience it. They can participate in it. They can taste it. They can feel it. Yep. And it creates this dream. But that statistic aside that it's one in 10 million, I want to bring your attention to the quote that Roland Martin, who's also in the film, that he says, he makes the point, listen, kids do understand that there are so many other well-paying jobs that do not involve what's happening on the court, the field, the whatever, but where you can still be surrounded or a part of the, the game that you're passionate about. Right. You know, whether you're an orthopedic surgeon or a, a team manager or a general manager, but the point being that it just expands the perspective of so many of these children. Right, right, right. Let's see, um, I think this may be our last clip. Let's see this last clip and um, see what we're gonna say about it. That was great. Yeah. I mean, you really did a, a, a marvelous job of like making this really like a big, it's <laughs> a big thing. Like, da, 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 da. You know, it well, big. it's actually so funny. I mean, I was thinking with that, with Coach Billy's speech in there, it's so funny. It reminds me in some respects um, of Gene Hackman's speech in Hoosiers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except, yeah. you know, they're yeah. 11 year olds and you look at them and they're so serious. I mean, as far as they're concerned, they're going off to play in the Super Bowl. Exactly. You know, this well, I'm is ready the to go. I'm like, I'm ready to like jump. I'm like the broad light, broad light lights. Come on. So. No, really a great, really a great job, Crystal. Every time I see something new, I'm like, wow, yeah. So listen, I think. I think it's now time um, you've digested this, and I think uh, we actually, not only do I think it's time, but the prompter told me it's time for Q&As, too. Hi, I'm sorry I missed this film, uh, All-Star Weekend, so looking forward to tomorrow night to the airing. But um, pardon my ignorance about some AAU things. These kids on your team that we focused on tonight, on your film, they're at different schools, am I correct at that? Yes. Okay, so how... How are their grades managed by a team? It's not a school team. And I'm assuming they have 
school that they have to complete to be able to be on the team, whether or not they're talented or not. Am I right? And there's a follow-up, if you don't mind. Um, so, ec excellent question. First of all, they with, with this particular AAU program, New Heights, there's mandatory after-school tutoring before they can go to practice. They also have to submit their report, copies of their report cards and progress reports. Um, so there's a, there's a, you know, a, a trust but verify that your grades are above a certain level to be able to, to play. Thank you. I, I don't have kids, so I, this whole thing is like a, you know, my friend's kid stories. Um, <laughs> God, I forgot my son. The second question I have, this is a nice team and they get along. I'm curious, is every kid on this team as talented as another? I mean, there's certainly other, you know, pay grades and certain like that, but is there a kid on this team that's not really a basketball player, but he needs a team environment? He needs a, a home outside of his home that he knows he's never, never going to be a starter. He's not called a bench warmer. That's not nice, but he's part of a team. And he'll get in a couple of minutes, maybe every game, if it's a, unless it's a close game. Is that? Yeah, no, there's definitely a wide array of talent uh, on that team. And one thing about Coach Billy is all of the kids are embraced. They, this was a role playing team. There was not some, I mean, granted, they're 11 years old, but they were not, not a 30 point score for every game. Each kid was happy playing their role. If one kid, you know, in fact, one of the kids on that team, maybe only play two, three minutes a game, but he could get up and he could make a three. He'd be happy with that. He might, you know, not play any, any other time, but he was, ha and he actually still plays on the same team with my son and this other kid, Judah. Thank you. Hey, how you doing? Um, Good, how you doing? With all the pressures of like financing and like environments and all of the, you know, the big contracts and stuff, you know, kids see as a, as, as a young, as young, um, how do you as a mom, how do you keep it, how do you keep the, the dream genuine and pure for your son and, you know, keeping his eye on just like having fun and, you know, not worrying about those things? That's, that's actually a, that's a great question. Um, <clears throat> just this past summer, my son was going from seventh to eighth grade. And I mean, he's evolved into a, um, a talented a uh, player, a talented kid in the class of 2019. And he loves the game, deeply passionate about it. Um, but he started to get asked to leave his AAU team and go to other teams that maybe have more talent, which I said no. He started getting asked to come play in this all-star game and that all-star game. Yes, they have all-star games for 12 and, you know, 12 and 13 year olds, 11 year olds. A couple I let him do. And I always had it in the top of my mind, I never want to make it a job for him at this age. I never want him to get burnt out from it. And he got asked to come to this very prestigious camp, all-star camp, at the end of the summer, at the end of August. And he'd been basically playing 11 months AAU basketball. And all the enticements that you could imagine were surrounding this offer for him to come play in this game. It was going to be, you know, televised on ESPN. They were going to play, you know, on the water. And they were going to get free gear, free gym shoes, meet these NBA players, blah, blah, blah. It was his last summer. It was like Labor Day weekend. Excuse me. It was his last weekend with the family before school started. And we talked about it. And he said, you know... It's an honor. I mean, this is by, I mean, he didn't say these exact words. I'm translating, but he's like, basically, he's like, it's an honor. But I really just want to stay at home, relax and chill with my family. And that part of that came from us knowing sort of his trajectory, that this was going to be his last summer before craziness really began. And I just wanted to keep that pure, that he can play the game when he wants to, but he still has to have the balance of being with family and being with friends. And so I think, though, that comes from the parent. You know, I asked at the very beginning, how did this change your relationship with Cole? But now that he's sort of now on the, on the track, on what I call the conveyor belt, to be a, a player, I mean, you start hearing people say, well, now he can really play. And again, you sort of mentioned it, but what does that mean in terms of you really beginning to monitor it and and walking that line between just kind of letting it go and really being like a, a hawk on this. Because, yeah. It requires management now because how, how do I give examples without sounding like that mom who's like talking about her child um, <laughs> too much? Um, 
We just have to, we, I have to monitor it and I have to make sure that it's fine. You're talented in basketball, but the priorities are your academics. You know, even though you might be getting calls from colleges now when you're 14 years old, these colleges that are calling you and that you're interested in going playing basketball, guess what? You still, go, to get into these schools, you still have to really get in. <laughs> you right. know, we're not going the, you're getting in and you can't read. <laughs> you're getting in and you can't get a solid score on the SAT. So there is that responsibility. There is that discussion. And also that this is all fine and good and God forbid, but with any player we've seen, you could get injured tomorrow. You know, you could you could all of a sudden, as great as you might think you are now or whatever they're saying about you ratings wise, all of a sudden, you know, you could be up here and be down here. So keeping the priorities straight is something that we constantly have a conversation with him about. So it's so it's academics, it's character. I'll give you an example. Team USA, like they're trying to put him on a track to be on the Team USA. But to be selected for that, it's about character, academics than athletic ability. Mm. And so it's a reminder. We, we dangle it sort of as a carrot, but um, if you don't have those things straight, the athletics, that's the last thing that's going to really help you out. <laughs> How did the big, uh, these major uh, league basketball players get involved? So um, Amari Stoudemire came on as my executive producer, and he was brought on by another producer on the film, a woman by the name of, of Tammy Brooke, and um, another producer of mine who's here tonight, Lisa Bonner. Um, she brought on Lupe Fiasco, who I think him being on board attracted Amari, because Amari's also a big music guy. And with Amari on board, you know, the other players who have in incredibly busy schedules, uh, not really having time to do much of anything except focus on basketball, Amari sort of gave it um, the, the thumbs up of this is a, a, a sports documentary that's going to truly be about youth basketball, show it in a positive yet, you know, um, truthful light. And he sort of, you know, helped me um, at least get it in front of them, at least to make the decision whether or not they wanted to be involved in it. So it so got Walt Clyde Frazier in it, Joakim Noah, Steve Nash, J.R. Smith, of course, we mentioned Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony. Um, and then, you know, Bill, Bill Roden is in the film as well. Um, you know, great minds, um, which, by the way, I have to say, bringing in um, individuals to comment on the state of youth basketball besides NBA players was important to me because I also wanted to have that perspective that is sort of the equalizer and offers a, um, a real perspective on it so we could get points like Travis King made or, or Butch Graves who's in the film from Black Enterprise and his point is you as a young man or young woman playing basketball have to learn to use basketball as much as basketball uses you. That is a great quote. It was a great job, Crystal. Uh, see the film tomorrow and beyond and tell people about it. Was it tweeted out? But thanks so much. Really, thank you, but thank you. It was a great job.